Hello, everybody. Um, I was introduced uh, as the um, the general manager of Lewis Masonic. You probably saw that on the on the uh, adverts for this talk. But today, I talk to you as a hermeticist, not as a publisher. So my lifelong calling has been the study of the hermetic path, and indeed where other people, they have social lives and they, they watch television and read fiction. I spend my time contemplating hermetic texts, looking at the stars and being in nature. We were told at the beginning of our meeting that the, the goal of this society is to contemplate and explore the mysteries. But why do we have these, these mysteries in every culture? I think we have these mysteries because somewhere inside us we know we're more than what we appear to be. And indeed if we look in every culture there are traditions which claim to teach the secrets of evolution from this state to a higher state. And it gets a bit complicated. Sometimes this is philosophical. Sometimes there are certain practices you need to undertake. Sometimes there are rituals you need to go through. Often there are lengthy texts designed to lead us to a state of enlightenment or uh, to bring around an inner transformation. In every tradition, you get a special person who comes forth who wishes to cut through the limitations of a human tradition and uh, to get directly to the understanding. And there are some beautiful texts that summarize the whole path, the whole method of transformation in just a few words. In the Buddhist tradition, we could see the Heart Sutra as this, just, a, just one scroll that tells you everything you need to know. In yoga, we have the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, a few paragraphs, but a lot of commentary and tuition to understand. Maybe in Christianity, some people may feel the Lord's Prayer summarizes everything. In Hermeticism, we have the Emerald Tablets. This mysterious work, and we can see a, a depiction of what this could have been like, has been highly respected by the greatest spiritual authorities in the Western tradition since it appeared for all to read. It's very interesting uh, to note that there are many cultures that have an idea of a, a stone tablet which is green, which teaches secret knowledge that can allow you to bring around special effects or to, to bring around a transformation of the self. In uh, China, for example, they have a, a tradition of jade tablets which are stored in heaven. And now and again, uh, when one of the... Uh, Immortals either gifts one or by mistake leaves one, we get a hint of the real truth. In the ancient Egyptian traditions, uh, there was a thought of uh, a tablet that had fallen uh, from, a, uh, from the sky, like a meteorite, and we can imagine that being green, and it had hieroglyphs on. And we'll learn a little bit more about the, the myths or behind the emerald tablet in a moment. So the Emerald Tablet offers the answer to that mystery of mysteries. What all these different paths aim to do to bring around that transformation from a limited human being to something higher. Whether you call that a Buddha, a saint or a God. This is the dream behind all these paths. And could this small text contain these mysteries? In ancient times, when someone was to be as ambitious as to dare to dream of such thing, he would start with a prayer. Because surely, 
in order to really touch on something as, as high as this, we brave explorers in this room may need to go beyond our intellect and reach forth with something more within us. The Animal Habit of Hermes True without falsehood, certain most true. That which is above is like that which is below. That which is below is like that which is above. Know this to make the miracle of the one thing. As all things were made from the meditation of one mind, so all things are born of one thing. Its father is the sun, its mother the moon. The wind carries it in its womb, and the earth is its nursemaid. It is the creator of all works of wonder in the world. Separate thou the earth from the fire, the subtle from the gross, with great effort and industriousness. Success will be assured. With great wisdom, it ascends from the earth to heaven, and again it descends to earth, and takes back the power from above and from the below. Thus, you will receive the glory of distinctiveness of the world. All obscurity will flee from This is the whole most strong strength of all strength, for it overcomes all subtle things and penetrates all solid things. Thus was the world created. From this comes marvellous adaptions, of which this is the procedure. Therefore, I am called Hermes, the thrice crowned, because I have three parts of the wisdom of the whole of the world. And complete is what I had to say about the work of the sun. You will read many alchemical interpretations of this text. Uh, people will show you how the instructions it contains teaches you to bring around a transformation from lead gold, or how the instructions it contains can bring around any transformation you wish. In this talk, I'm going to give you a hermetic interpretation, one which I believe is just as important, for in this tale, you are the lead which will become gold. The Emerald Tablet has as with all ancient texts, excited many people's imaginations. And great tales as to where it has come from have appeared. Some have come from a feeling inside. They, uh, people can sense the wisdom, they can sense the beauty of its message, and they need to find some way to express this. Others need it to come uh, to a decision as to where it came from in order to escape persecution if they are part of a specific religion. And others enjoy dreams of the mystical and of the exotic. So, so that's animation there. The tablet, the most common thing you'll hear about it is, as I mentioned, that it was a meteorite that came to Earth which had hieroglyphics on it. And indeed, at this point, I'd ask to, for some help for anyone who ever uh, hears this uh, talk. I was once in a museum in my teenage years, and I actually saw a, uh, a piece of Egyptian writing, uh, it's ancient um, stele, and the note next to it said, this is a copy of a legendary uh, 
item that was said to have come uh, to Earth, uh, fallen uh, in the form of a meteorite with hieroglyphs on it. At the time, it was just another item, as you see when you go through museums. And it was only in my mid-twenties I thought, hang on. I've never worked out where it was. It may have been um, in a, an actual museum in Luxor. It may be somewhere in the British Museum. Everywhere I go, I, I ask. You'll also hear this story. Hermes was the son of Adam, and he wrote the tablet to show man mankind how to redeem itself from his father's sins in the Garden of Eden. And this gets passed all the way down to Noah. So, in this case, um, I believe it's Seth, who is the uh, son of Adam. This is a very convenient um, story, and this shows, gives it the, um, a religiously acceptable reason to be studying Hermes. But uh, equivalencies in different traditions were a very common thing in early um, esoteric writing. So, sometimes um, Hermes is Enoch, and we can hear a little bit about this later on. In um, Muslim traditions and in the um, uh, traditions in the same parts of the world before Islam, they often, Hermes was identified with Enoch because they, they both have a similar experience. The vision of Hermes describes Hermes um, tuning in to the divine mind, and then he sees everything and understands everything. Enoch, of course, walked with God, and then he was not because God took him. In um, other texts, her, there are um, descriptions of Enoch going through all seven levels of heaven, and seven levels of heaven, of course, would correspond so beautifully with the hermetic uh, harmony of the spheres. So, in many texts which will um, We'll get mentioned in a few moments. We see Enoch, Idris, and Hermes are all the same figure. This is one you see published in some very popular, exciting uh, books. It's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so, for some reason, this a story that gets cut it and pasted all over the place gets put in a book and then re-referenced on the internet is that uh, the Pyramid of Cheops uh, contained the Emerald Tablet. This is certainly not true. Anyone who's ever read anything from Egypt will know that the symbolism contained the writing. Yeah, this couldn't be the case. Okay, this is another one you see appearing. The tablet was written by and venerated by the Hermetic Order, or a Hermetic Order, and contemplated the meetings of the means of enlightenment. If this is true, it certainly isn't the original hermeticists which were in Alexandria. It was the um, Hermetosabians, which would be a group of um, Aramaic or Arabic uh, practitioners who would be in uh, one day Iran and Iraq. Um, so, And then we move to the tablet was Atlantean and secretly protected by enlightened individuals. <clears throat> There's a lot of confusion here. There is a channeled text, uh, a large book called The Emerald Tablets of uh, the Thoth the Atlantean. And this is a very different text, and it's not related to the Emerald Tablet we're talking about at all. But the two in, in the modern uh, world get sort of a bit mixed up. Atlantis, of course, the first reference to Atlantis is Plato. And we have to be careful because uh, Plato, of course, talks very clearly about founding any tradition on a noble lie. And one of the noble lies he suggests would be ideal would be a previous perfect civilization. <laughs> so uh, his, his tale may be so good. So, where did the Emerald Tablet come from? The first appearance that has been discovered so far is in this book, the book of Balanus, The Wise on the Causes. This is a, a beautiful 
text. Um, it may be a little bit early and I've put it here. I've, I've said 6th century, might be a bit earlier. So this is, um, again, an, an Arab text, and this is a text which is meant to be by Apollonius of Tyana. So Apollonius of Tyana was a neo-Pythagorean. Um, um, some people say um, uh, that uh, he had the ability to talk to animals, and uh, you, many of the tales you hear of Apollonius are very similar to the miracles we see worked in the New Testament by Jesus. Apollonius is a very interesting character. He had seven magic rings, one for each day of the week. So on the Monday, he had the power of the moon. So if he was very intuitive, he could make himself very ethereal. He had those great powers. And yes, on Tuesday, of course, he'd have the power of, would it chew Mars, would it be? And uh, he'd be able to do these uh, exciting things on there. Um, on Wednesday, of course, it would be um, the power of Mercury, uh, so he'd be able to, uh, rather than bring war during his Mars day, he'd be able to uh, read all languages, he'd be able to uh, read minds, these kind of things. And I always thought it was quite an interesting tale, because if you went to Apollonius for help with something, and he said, oh, I'm having really problems with my, my wife, would he say, visit me Friday? <laughs> So, um, first things first, this isn't by Apollonius in any shape or form. It's a composite text, and it's a very beautiful composite text, and most of it appears to be taken by a treatise uh, written by a Christian who's living in the same area, probably in, as I said, where, where we would now see as Iran, and he's trying to match Neo-Pythagorean um, thought and Neoplatonic thought um, with Christianity and he does so beautifully so um, the regrowing of your wings to go back to be able to explore the world of forms becomes your resurrection through um, the, the path of Jesus however he was abstract enough that it could be corrupted and published uh, a lot with a lot of other things and in this contains the story of the discovery of the Emerald Tablet. Now, if anyone here who knows a bit about Hermeticism, this may be a bit of a strange leap to make, whereby we have the discovery of Hermetic writings by a Neo-Pythagorean. And it's going to get even more strange as time goes on, because what I've discovered about this period of history is that if you are a... Um, a scholar in this uh, particular area of the world, a bit like we see yoga as one tradition here, and it could be tantric, it could be Vedic, it could be from this side of India, it could be that, they saw uh, the Greek traditions the same. So you get these wonderful circumstances where the Hermeticists there uh, believe that Aristotle uh, just brings Hermeticism through. And you, you even have hermeticists uh, studying Aristotle as part of their path. So studying logic and so on. And yes, it will, we'll come to some of these interesting uh, ideas in a few moments. So it is a beautiful text, a very wise text, and it contains a story of the discovery of the Emerald Tablet. Let's let every word and action In my city of birth, a stone statue was standing on a pillar of gold, on which was written, Look upon me, I am Hermes, the thrice greater wisdom. I have placed this miraculous sign for everyone to see, veiled with my wisdom, so no one would come near it except the wise sage as I am. On the front was written in archaic script. Whoever wants to know the secrets of creation and acquiring more knowledge about the manifestations of nature, search under my foot. 
But the people did not understand what was meant and looked under his foot. They did not find anything. In such a time, I was weak of mind due to my youth. However, when my spiritual nature matured, I read again. And what was written on front of the pillar took on a new significance. I started to dig under the pillar and behold I arrived at a subterranean chamber filled with darkness. No sunbeam entered and as though the sun stood high above it there was ceaseless blowing winds. It was as if someone had enchanted the winds and had built a house for the wind, swirling around continuously and growing in strength. Due to the darkness, I did not have a chance to enter the chamber, and due to the strong wind, not a flicker of light would stay lit. My sorrow was so great, I was powerless. After hours of toil and struggle, a sleep came over me. As I lay in a state of restfulness, I contemplated with a worried heart the difficult situation I'd arrived in. Then an old grey-haired man appeared in front of me, having the same posture and body as me, and he spoke thus. O oh, Balanus, rise and enter the chamber so that you may reap knowledge of the secrets of creation and the manifestation of nature. In this darkness, I can't see anything, and the flame will not stay steady because of the strong wind, which keeps pushing me back. Place your light in a glass container so that you can protect it from the wind, and not let it be blown out and thus you will obtain light. Who are you to bestow upon me this benevolence? I am your own sensitive and perfected self. After such, I awoke full of joy and placed a light in a glass container as my spiritual self had advised me Using this, I entered the chamber. Behold, before me, I saw the statue of an old man sitting on a golden throne. Holding in his hand a plate of green emerald, on which I could read this is the description of nature. In front of him was a book, and on that cover I could read, This is the secret of creation and of the knowledge regarding the cause of all things. tablet was gained. So, here we have a very interesting story where we can draw some, there you go, sorry, some exciting parallels. First of all, 
anyone here who is a member of a Rosicrucian tradition can't fail to see the connection in that story uh, between the discovery of Christian Rosencrantz's tomb, whereby the wind blows back and they have to fight to get through to find preserved hidden knowledge in the form of a sacred text, which is then retrieved. A invisible light that lights your way. In this case, the light is given to you by your future perfected self. That's kind of like a, a, a guide, isn't it? That could be your holy guardian angel or a spirit guide. So whoever wrote the Rosicrucian texts most certainly was aware of this story. And indeed, one thing we will discover as we explore is that the Greek Hermetic texts that we tend to know more now were not in such circulation uh, in the medieval times and uh, the times that follow as the, the actual um, Arabic Hermetica, these other texts which have Hermetic um, implications. We can also see a parallel between that and the vision of Hermes in the Corpus Hermeticum. So a, a, f a falling asleep and the receiving of enlightenment through sleep, very much like Hermes himself. But it's not through this original beautiful work we just mentioned, uh, attributed to Blanus, that we've actually found the Emerald Tablet. The story I showed to you um, is very rarely known because it actually came through this text. So this translates as the, the book of the secrets of secrets, or the, the secrets of all creation. And it's a text which claims to be by <coughs> Aristotle writing letters to Alexander the Great about how to be a good king. And you can imagine the, uh, the history of Alexander invading and um, overthrowing the Persian empire there, that it leaves the culture there with great respect for Alexander, but also not quite sure how they feel about him. And Aristotle becomes the ultimate advisor, a man whose philosophy is so powerful that he could create an indestructible student as in the form of Alexander. So what could you imagine that this amazing text, which is a, an, an ancient a Persian dream of Aristotle uh, talking to Alexander would contain. What advice would we give to the, the potential king of the, the whole of the known world? <coughs> well, it's a very strange idiosyncratic book. Advising Aristotle, uh, Aristotle advising Alexander in a way that nobody who knows anything about either Aristotle or Alexander would ever put in there advising Alexander not to be too drawn into affairs with women. And if we know about Alexander, he actually had to be locked in with a woman uh, in order to sort of, uh, his mum to be sure that he be, would be interested. He was interested in conquering places uh, and uh, ruling. He wasn't interested in these, these things so much. But likewise, we have great advice on how to make sure that you choose the right fish and to know that they're, that, uh, Fish with certain types of skin are inedible. Not to drink cold water if you've had uh, too much meat. How to tell by big people, the shape of people's noses what their personality is going to be like and how you can trust them. Uh, a cure for drunkenness involves hanging yourself over a river and rubbing a balm of sandalwood into your stomach while sniffing um, frankincense incense. Oh, it's a horrible book. <laughs> Uh, but when you get to the end, suddenly it changes pace. So all these letters, they're advising on don't kill the wise people in the new country that you've conquered. Make sure your kindness is in balance and this goes to the right people. The kind of advice I was giving you on uh, culinary habits, on, on exercise and things. And then suddenly the pace changes to, to this. Alexander, my son, listen very, very carefully because I'm going to tell you the secrets of all secrets. I'm going to give you the light by which you will find the way to immortality. Some medieval texts then have a, a small warm-up 
almost like a commentary on it. And these are quite fun. Uh, they will talk of the philosopher's stone. So they will say, and may God be with you to fully understand this mystery. For there is a stone, Alexander, that is not a stone. But yet it is like all stones. The kind of stone that you would find at the top of a mountain or in a quarry. But not like that stone. Yes, this stone, it breathes and it lives. But it also dies. And it comes in all colours. Uh, but it cannot be detected by reason alone or by the senses that you have. And then we get the emerald tablets. So it's obviously been uh, put uh, in there. This whole text gets translated, and a lot of these pseudo-Aristotelian texts appear at the time uh, in medieval uh, Britain, and they're cherished. Uh, there's one, one I, I think is quite fun, which is uh, called the Book of the Apple. And the Book of the Apple is Aristotle on his deathbed, and he's attempting to die. He's actually, he's, 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 that's what he's wanting to do. But students are there with him asking questions about philosophy and hidden things. And every time he try, he's about to go, they, they put an apple under his nose, and the smell of it revives him. Aristotle often brings forth the wisdom of Hermes. And this is because Hermes has been backdated and in particular, at in this time, by the time we're in the 8th century, Hermes um, is a Babylonian um, who had great wisdom, who went to Egypt, and he taught this, and then the Greeks stole that wisdom, and now the, the um, Muslim academics are bringing it back home. And this is a means whereby it is acceptable for them to be studying Greek philosophy. And uh, this, this works very well for them. And here we can see a wonderful imagining of Aristotle with his pupil Alexander. And I don't know if that's any more realistic than the advice in, in the text I just mentioned. So here it is. <coughs> it comes into uh, Latin and from the 12th century onwards, this becomes the thing to study. But like me, many people who are generally interested in the actual doing it, they really want to walk this path, they know what fish is good to eat and they're not concerned with hangover cures, they start to extract the valuable bit out and the emerald tablet becomes a standalone text and into this text, they start to insert increasingly alchemical contents. So this text starts off uh, being frustratingly uh, concerned with trivialities and unrealistic, and it becomes increasingly valuable and, and esoteric, so it evolves. So, we want to understand the tablet uh, to get to the lesson behind it. And in order to do this, we need to make sure we've got it in context. And the context is of that is of the Hermetic tradition. And without a grounding in Hermetic philosophy, the ideas will come up with our, our guesses and uh, won't lead us any closer. So, let's talk just a little bit about Hermeticism, and uh, I, will, I will attempt to take the Hermetic tradition to the next step. So, um, around the first century, um, we have these interesting texts uh, being written. And some people date them a bit earlier, some a bit later. We're not so interested in history here, we're interested in the essence. Does, can this teach us something? So we heard earlier on, our previous uh, speaker mentioned Serapis. Serapis was a composite deity. He was uh, a combination of Dionysus and Osiris put together. And uh, the Greeks didn't really like uh, the Egyptian gods' animal heads and the uh, Egyptians didn't like anyone else's tradition at all. 
So Serapis didn't really work. <clears throat> but Hermes seemed to. And Hermes Trismegistus is a very interesting figure. So Hermes is a composite deity uh, or a, a t ancient teacher who is uh, Mercury and Thoth combined. And now there is uh, quite a lot of evidence um, from the accounts at the time that this was a genuine process going on. So if we were to be able to go back in time, we'd be able to visit the enlightened individuals that produced this text. And these collection of writings were written by Greeks who were obviously trained in the Greek philosophical style living in Alexandria. And we know that because in some of the, uh, the more magical texts, there are, there are sort of comments saying that that's about other scholars that don't have Greek words properly. <clears throat> we know from the Nag Hammadi um, discovery that a lot of them weren't very good at Greek who were writing, so this is obviously some of the Egyptian priests were learning uh, Greek, but there's some translations in there of Plato which demonstrate they, they were still working on it, where the meaning is completely different. But essentially what happened here, um, and we, we can see this in Iamblichus, described absolutely clearly, there were priests of Thoth who were in Hermopolis, and Greeks went to them to learn. And what they did was, they asked a lot of questions. And you can see this happening a bit now with modern traditions as well. You can see, so they went to a religious person who was a master of their art and asked them questions about how, you, how they did it. So when you, when you go to sleep so that you can communicate with the, um, the higher um, forces, how do you do that? How do you write that down? This text, what does it mean? And we can imagine this unconscious competence in the Egyptian priests. A bit like if we went to superb athletes and said, right, running. So how are you doing that? It would probably take them a bit of thinking. But you can, you can extract information from people who are excellent in a field if you're patient and you watch and you listen. So they translated the religious texts and religious ideas of ancient Egypt into the philosophical language of the day so that other Greeks could understand it. And we end up in a beautiful circumstance. So there was a society about that time which had men and women all together from the different spiritual traditions, uh, spending time together and learning from each other probably under the guidance of Egyptian priests and with a very strong influence from the, uh, the sacred traditions of uh, Greece. So we know that there are Neopythagoreans, there are Neoplatonists, there are people from the Eleatic school. So much so that there's mounting evidence that the, uh, they took on some of these beliefs, the love of mathematics, the um, vegetarianism as a practice in some hermetic groups, the belief in reincarnation. So uh, it was very multicultural. Um, we also know that um, gymnom sophists visited Alexandria, so there were, there were probably Buddhists and uh, f followers of the Vedic traditions there too. So, the next slide I'm going to attempt to take that to the next step for you. So we've gone from ancient Egyptian religious language through to philosophical language. Now these mysteries are going to be explained in the scientific and psychological language of now. So the Hermeticists believed that all things were formed of pure consciousness. There was only one substance. And that we made uh, mistakes believing that some things were less real than others. This consciousness uh, condenses to varying different degrees. So the most solid would be the things we, we see and we sense. We might see this uh, lesser would be uh, 
perhaps some energies, like maybe you could see heat or, or sound or electromagnetism. This would be a le a less dense. To the hermeticist, there was an underlying substance. Uh, they called this uh, noose, this higher consciousness, this uh, behind all things. So let's imagine this spark of consciousness is in all living beings to some degree. Imagine a tree. A tree has very little consciousness. And we can imagine its vibration would be very slow. It is aware of what's going on around it, but only in a responsive way. It's maybe a step beyond cause and effect. It can move its leaves in a certain direction. It can sense when there's a change. Maybe you could imagine that it does this by its consciousness just takes on the vibrations of things uh, which it's in contact with. Then we move to smaller, um, small animals which actually have specialised organs of thought. So to the, from the hermetic point of view, the brain is just a receiver. So just like if we looked inside a radio and we saw things happening, someone who didn't understand might think that that was the thing producing the noise. And you could say, look, look, I've shown, look, when I, pre when I press this bit, it stops making a noise, therefore, that's the end of it. You know, that's, it's the noise comes from in here. And it's the same with the, the brain from the hermetic point of view. This is a receiver. Your, your consciousness is, is um, what is the, uh, the subject that we're focusing on. So the fly, or beetle, it's got some good senses. And it can reproduce what's outside it, inside. So it can reproduce it. So again, from the hermetic point of view, this is actually shaping something. The way you think is by shaping this substance. If you visualize very keenly something, you're making something out of this substance. You're being fed through your mind. When you talk to yourself, you're reproducing a voice in your mind. You're imagining that. The fly can't do that. The fly can reflect on what's around it to a limited degree and can respond. It's only when we start to get further up we see this facility of imagination. And so we can see um, maybe a, a bear. He can, he's got a bit beyond that fly. He's got memory, so he can take an impression from the past and reproduce it. And he's got planning. So he can see an opportunity to get the honey, and he can think, and he can, hasn't got words, so he can imagine <coughs> one course of action and how he might get stung, and think, hmm, and imagine another course, and he can reference the past. From the hermetic point of view, he is creating these in his mind eye. So these are actually being shaped out of the substance. By the time you get to us, something special's happened something that could be a gift, or it could be a fluke. You can sense inside you that your consciousness is far stronger. So much stronger that you have the word. So you can actually form abstract thought, and this is what puts you apart. And whether deliberately or by um, luck, this higher ability allows for some very special things to happen. So you can think of love without having to visualize a loving embrace which is specific because of your words. The hermeticists believe this also meant that you could evolve your consciousness beyond the limitations of anything else that ever lived. It could be trained. It could be transformed. It could become permanent. So that, unlike the fly who passes away, you could carry on. Eudaimonia. In this picture, we have Hermes 
having his vision of enlightenment. For those of you who haven't read the Hermetic text, it starts uh, with a, a beautiful vision whereby Hermes describes once, when thinking about all the things that are, a great tiredness, a sleep came across me. The kind of sleep you might get if you engage in too much physical work or eat too much. And then, as my body became very heavy and disappeared from my awareness, my consciousness soared to a great height. And in that state, he has contact with the big consciousness, the consciousness that's underlying everything. Eudaimonia is a, a term from ancient Greek, and it's one that um, many of the writers writing about um, the uh, philosophical schools use, and it's one used to describe the eventual goal. So it translates as good spiritedness, but it's more than that. So in the uh, Oriental traditions, they think in terms of enlightenment as something you know, something you're aware of. It's a state of seeing the truth. In Hermeticism, to see the truth, you have to be the truth. So this is you flourishing on all levels. Everything within you is reaching its full potential. It's interconnected. So you've got the right, uh, the right life, the right people around you. You've got the right attitude. You've got the right body, the right diet, the right goals, the right words, the right techniques. So eudaimonia is something you can't do on your own because on your own would be pretending that you're separate from everything else. So this, we could see this as a, the hermetic vision of enlightenment. Incidentally, the term eudaimonia is where I believe the term adepthood came from. Adepthood first appears in alchemical texts, and I believe that what was happening is if you and I try to think of this term, we say, well, what would it mean, good at everythingness in English? Being really, truly you in a <coughs> perfect way. What would that be? And I think adepthood's probably the closest they could come up with, and I think that's... That's quite good. So, and now we're going to go further. We're going to walk the path to eudaimonia. We will follow the path, which is the path behind all traditions. And we need to be clear here there are many laudable other things around the tradition. There are good acts, there's great knowledge. And many of these are very exciting, very interesting. But if we could, if we could have a few moments with someone who has truly done it, if, if you could meet with a saint, meet with a Buddha, you could find a perfected yogi and you can ask him, what is the difference between someone at the beginning of the path and at the end? And you could get to the, the essence of it. Let go of the memorization of different historical things or comparative religion or Kabbalistic trees or words or properties. Mm -hmm. What is the actual transformation that takes place? Could he describe it to you? Are you a caterpillar asking what it's going to be like to be a butterfly? So, as we reach forth here, I'm going to describe the process to you. I'm going to describe how it feels, what actually happens, what the traditions say. But these words and these feelings, these visions, these ideas, that is the finger pointing. You have to reach forth and grasp your own eudaimonia. And when you feel it, put that in the bottle and put the cork on it so that the wind doesn't blow it out so you can go and find your tablet. So here we go.
True without falsehood, certain most true, the first line. Some people see this as a, a triple affirmation, as in Hermes, thrice great. And three reassurances or three statements are, are quite um, well recorded in Egyptian tradition. We found a lovely thing now. We found a, a training manual for Egyptian scribe that is just when the Greeks are starting to, to um, occupy uh, Egypt. And this title, Thrice Great, is used for Hermes. Some people see it as four. Some people see it um, as the elements. So it's, it's true in the material. So you could use what we're about to describe to do anything business-wise, anything invention-wise. It's true emotional. If you needed to transform something, if you needed to change a state of people's emotions from one to another, you could use this. It's true intellectually. If you wanted to see the truth, you want to know what's actually going on. And it's true spiritually. This is the, the uh, if you want to have a direct genuine connection. But it's important here that I mention a bit about truth. So, um, we've all heard the term philosophy. And we know that the Egyptian priests used to call themselves lovers of truth, or that he who loves knowledge, sometimes we have the title. So, and this philosopher title that appears um, in our... Uh, early philosophical traditions in Sicily and what we now call southern Italy, where the word philosophy appears, probably wasn't a new idea. They may have been inspired by this. But to love truth is something beyond intellectual understanding. For the original writers of this, for the Hermeticists that came since, it's about being the truth. It's about wanting to have a clear vision so your beliefs are not convenient beliefs that make you feel good or get approval from other people. They're not truths, uh, information that comes to you from other people. You will be the truth in the sense you want to see things clearly, even if they're hard to see, even if um, they are inconvenient. You will only speak the truth under all circumstances because your words are your thoughts made manifest. And you will be the truth, as in you will be genuine. Now, it's easy to think, of course I'm genuine. Uh, but philosophers um, of that time used to do fun things to wake people up to how they weren't and how much work needed to be. It takes skill to be genuine. You've got to change your character. They'd ask inconvenient questions of people. So that there'd be a, a town mayor or a, a man of great standing in public and they'd say to him do you value kindness and helping those who are in need of help more than you do your own pleasure and he'd say yes and they'd say well then why every year do you spend the same amount of money going on holiday than you could use to pay for someone to be healed ah or they'd you know, wander to the gym and everyone would be working at the gymnasium and say, ah, it's wonderful. Do you consider yourselves heroic figures? You, you look like Hercules. They'd say, yes, yes, we're soldiers. And they say, wonderful. Why aren't you spending your time helping people physically? There's an old lady who needs wood being chopped. Why are you just lifting weights up and down in a room? Please tell me. I don't know. I'm ignorant. I want to understand. Is it that you want to... Because to me, that... That would be being a hero, not looking like one. And we could ask all the same hard questions ourselves, couldn't we? So we could actually think about that. Um, at this, every, everyone we meet uh, talks of high ideals. Uh, we do that ourselves. But if someone really does something in this society, it shocks people. And I don't mean on a a big scale, I mean on a small scale. Just try this. Next time there's a circumstance when you're meant to be quiet, actually really do it. So we're so used to people being off target, being confused with their goals, that when we're snoozing and they come in, we expect them to make quite a bit of noise. If you don't, 
the person will be will jump out of their skin when they realise you're there, because they're not you. We're not used to that level of genuineness. Listen to people's problems and listen to um, how they approach things. Um, here's, here's a fun example, a recent example, but please excuse me for this, but it's uh, it's one that everyone here will hear <coughs> at some point. You'll hear someone explain to you that their partner isn't um, as intimate with them as they want them to be. And if you ask that person, if you listen, you say to them, oh my word, that sounds like trouble. What are you doing about this? They will never, ever give you a realistic strategy. So, um, you will sit next to someone and they will tell you how their, their things aren't in harmony with their wife and they don't, you know, don't feel they're getting enough affection. And when you talk to them, you will never hear someone say, now you mention it, Martin. I am wooing her in a way that no man has ever wooed a woman. I've got this wonderful stress because I know her best. I've got roses arriving every Thursday and we're doing this, perhaps, perhaps I do it on Friday. My Apollonius would help me. Mm -hmm. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really bringing things together that I'm making an adaption to, I'm showing them the man. No, their plan is normally to complain to her, which is a plan that never really works. So something isn't true. It doesn't want the goal to happen. So being true is often about getting out of your own way and actually really engaging with the goal. And um, to give you another example, I once saw a, a Japanese Christian come to Britain who really believed, actually believed. So he approached it a bit like when we go, often when we go to the Orient, we go along and we say, so this is a sacred place. When the miracle's starting? And they're going, yes, okay. He did that to, he did that to us. So he came over and he went and he, he um, had to do the prayer book, did all the prayers, spent all the time in church. Saying, why is it closed on Monday? And said, I hear there's a healing water nearby. I'm going to take some back from my mother. She's very ill. Okay, yeah, no, I heard miracles working. Now, where is it that the vision of the Virgin Mary happened? Should we go and camp there to the priest, you know? Mm -hmm. okay. Really doing it. So, keeping true. Uh, keeping on focus as to the true purpose. So these would be philosophers who are aiming to do this. <coughs> that which is above is like that which is below. That which is below is like that which is above. Know this uh, to make the miracle of the one thing. Now this is an extremely well quoted um, piece of uh, wisdom and it's something people use a lot. Just an uh, interesting aside, um, from this, the, um, the first recording I've seen of something similar to this is actually in Parmenides, and that's quite, that's quite interesting, so that it's, it's not uh, just um, from, from hermetic traditions. So this is um, talking about these levels of things. Um, <coughs> so there is this pure sense of consciousness that forms things just as you form things in imagination, <coughs> it's only a matter of degrees. So behind the wind that blows, this substance is moving in harmony with it. Everything is a thought in the big mind, condensing to a higher degree than yours does. You just need some practice. And this also acts as a very clear light on that truth. So one philosopher um, I know of had a very interesting uh, time going to each mystery school and actually saying to them, wonderful, so you have got secrets. And they say, yes. And they say, right. And they allow you to be special in some way. So yes. What do they allow? Say, Divine powers. So, okay, show me them. Okay. No, we can't show them. Okay, right. Well, let's see it in your life. Why are you living like everyone else? Okay. So, in, 
to shine a light on what we're trying to do, we should be looking at those whose words, actions, thoughts, and lives are closer to where we want to be. It is, it is a ludicrous thing to claim superiority that isn't demonstrable. And a, uh, a spectacular claim deserves spectacular evidence. I think that's true. <coughs> so um, this, uh, in Hermeticism, I've got to say they were a little bit more gentle than I'm putting forth. They had an, an idea of a great good behind the world that wasn't that shone forth for those with eyes to see it. But the principle of as above, so below is a very important practice we should uh, make our mental property. We should be sure to be aware of it. If this is correct, then nothing is hidden. You don't need to have direct vision, though this could be beneficial, of the hidden realms. Everything is standing straight before you. You want to know a person, it's in every word they say, every piece of clothing they put on, every way they move things. You cannot hide anything. Everything is a reflection of the higher forces at work. The <coughs> convenient attachments we make, or the um, spaces we make between things, are, are, uh, are not real. E everything is one. Know this to make the miracle of the one thing. So we see in many Hermetic texts this idea. Um, o Asclepius, all things are of one thing, or if not, they must be pertaining to one thing. We tend to think in a very segmented way. Cause, effect. One cause has one effect. That's actually not how the world works. Multiple causes have multiple effects. Multiple factors would have to change that. So, with our hermetic principles together, truth, we want to see things how they really are. We know things are all joined and all one. We know that all things are of consciousness. We can move on to this beautiful line. Sometimes you'll see this translated as contemplation, sometimes even mediation. Um, but uh, I prefer to draw on this translation, meditation, because it reflects uh, more what's going on. So the hermeticists believed that the divine was, be, was created from one mind. One mind is forming all this, there is one consciousness. This is uh, something they got from their ancient Egyptian origins, and uh, we can replace this beautiful but rather new age uh, vision here with the actual ancient Egyptian one. Here's Amun here, he's lying there, and the creative principle, the principle that moves behind things, the scarab, this like the scarab pushes the sun but you can't see it, it's the principle behind it, he's, he's dreaming of, of this. So, the same is true of you. And the hermeticists used to practice some very interesting arts to develop themselves. So meditation, by what we'd call it now, was very much part of their practice. Um, they used to refer to this in different ways. Um, in a healing context or a divinationary context, this was often referred to as incubation. So it was a kind of sleep where something brilliant grew. And the other terms they used for something that involves visualization, because we want to train this imagination and uh, or guided visualization, we see it now. They've called becoming aeon, becoming everything. So this would be a challenging practice, whereby someone would be pushing you to the limits of your imagination. The um, Incubation, incidentally, is quite interesting in the sense that if you read the text that uh, describe it and you look into the practice, the one big difference between hermetic practice and the oriental or the meditation we know now is meditation modernly is about going within yourself. You watch your breath, you clear your mind of thoughts, that kind of thing. The original hermetic practice was the opposite. 
it was going outside, it was being more. So you'd reach out for your senses, you'd sit in pure awareness of everything, and then you would reach further and further, your presence would have to extend. And this was uh, very much part of their, their practice. And likewise with the becoming Aeon, um, something you couldn't imagine meant something. So um, a lot of their texts are um, encouraging, so they say, if you think you can't do this, if you think you're just a limited person, then you will. But if you step forth, if you imagine yourself in the sky, you're there. Below the seas, you can do that. Yes, your mind can even go to the planets. And they would push their imagination to uh, and discover what things couldn't appear and what could. And here's a blank. <laughs> okay. Now we get to the first process. So we are all hermetic students. We've all learned how to do our meditation. We're all aware that the true self is our consciousness and that this is but an extension of it. We are training our awareness. We're becoming more aware in every moment. We'd be performing speeches like this. And my fellow hermeticists would look for any incongruities, anything illogical in what I said, any pauses, anything that showed my consciousness wasn't flowing as clearly as it could be. And you would help me adjust that. I'd be thinking logically and correctly. I'd be listening to my emotions in balance because of this training. I'd be practicing my meditation and I'd be reading what they called the basic discourses. I'd be reading the philosophy. Its father is, in the, uh, is the sun and the mother is the moon. The wind carries it in its womb, the earth is its nursemaid. Many people uh, speculate as to what this is, means, and they, they, uh, they come up with some very interesting and very um, valuable interpretations. <coughs> For me, the answer is absolutely clear, and that's because this path I'm describing to you is described in many other hermetic texts in plain language. It's to do with the four elements. So the, the whole of existence has been formed, we'd call them the states of matter, from the four elements. And so are you, and so is your mind. So we know people who are fiery. <clears throat> so a fiery person would use forcefulness and energy in order to achieve their goals. Uh, their main talents would be willpower. We know people who are um, air-like or airy. And we actually have terms for this, don't we? A firebrand for someone who's fiery. Have you heard that? Yes? And, you know, you can see, oh, a hothead. You can see that one. It's full of hot air. The, um, then we have air here. We have someone who's intellectual of the mind. And if someone has too much, if they're a little bit further beyond there, so they're not the academic who's memorising things, they are of the... Um, they're floating off. We say they're airy fairy, don't we? We say they're a bit of a floating off. We have the watery characters where everything's about emotions. So, after this speech, um, the five people would say, after this, would be saying that Martin, he really got to the point, now I can do it. Uh, the air people were saying, yeah, there weren't many references, were there? Yeah? I wonder if he's typed it out, if I can have a copy of it. There'd be more like this. The water person would be saying, that was inspiring. So, that, and then we have the earth person. So we have the water, we have a drip, don't we, for someone who's like that, or they're wet if they're too watery, like that. Um, and then we have a, uh, uh, the earth element person, the person who's um, very solid, and um, to them the world is far more material. And each one will use a strategy in life appropriate for that. So the earth person will use stability. So if you're trying to get them to do something, they'll just say, and they don't want to, they'll just hold on. They won't try to convince you emotionally. They won't be aggressive. They won't be emotional. They'll just, no. And earth strategies for things are quite fun. They often just position themselves in the place that works. So their business plans will be, I'm going to, Vend. I'm going to buy a, a store, and I'm going to stand stand outside 
this, uh, the students accommodation and sell chips. That's their whole business plan. Yeah. So that'd be a, a physical solution. So your mind is also made of this. Your emotions, your, your knowledge, your memory, your impressions of things, the quality of your actual consciousness, your willpower, your intentions are actually made of this. And to start evolving, they need to change. The, we know that all things are created from this mind stuff through these elements. So there are separate essences underlying things. And um, so too is your life and your personality being created. And you can, I've always loved this picture here. So you can see the shepherd here. He's peeping through the veil. This is the realm we can see. And this is the, as above, this is the realm of pure thought. So we have Roger Bacon doing the very process. The first process in every um, spiritual path that is generally doing this is going to be for you to balance your elements, to purify them and to integrate them. The various aspects of our personality which are not under our control. These can be areas that never got a chance to grow up. So it could be that fiery man I talked about earlier on. He's been aggressive, he was aggressive at school, it worked. And then he went into university and it was aggressive in that area and it worked. And now he's aggressive at work. And he's only got aggressive and fiery as an approach. And you can see this sometimes. You can see someone uh, trying to comfort someone else who doesn't have any other gear. So the person's saying, this terrible thing's happened. And they say, don't be so stupid, pull yourself out of it. You think, ooh, it's a strange approach. When it doesn't work, they try being more aggressive. So it could be that person hasn't grown up empathy. They never got a chance to develop it and they're scared. They're scared of doing that because actually everything's been working for them. Or, or has it with what they've got. It could be that you have a, um, an injury. It could be that, let's imagine you were young and you used the earth element as a strategy and it went wrong. You got really hurt from it, it really went wrong, so you thought, oh, I'm never going to stand up for myself again. I'm just going to find a way around it. I'll never disagree with anyone. And this could be a small thing. When you're very young, you can be quite sensitive to things. Sometimes it's an emergency response you've built. So maybe you learnt uh, certain hard times that you could talk a lot. And if you talked enough, no one would pick on you. And that's like a spasm, you know, you've got the injury from the being bullied and you've got the spasm in your shoulder that's trying to protect you. All these areas of your consciousness that are injured, unintegrated, it could be a conflict, it could be that you want different things and they're, they're in opposition, prevent you from fully exercising your <coughs> mental abilities. So the fully... Uh, balanced person who's achieved their hermetic rebirth from the first stage, they will no longer have mixed intentions. So when they're teaching someone, they will see it as an exercise in eloquence and empathy, they will be really trying to find a way to convey that knowledge. Before then, there may be a part of them that is concerned that a person may get better than them. So there'll be some conflict, they won't give it all away, and they might want to confuse it a bit. And likewise, this will interfere with your meditation practice. If you just sit still and watch your breath or sit still and tune into everything, the bits that are out of balance will come and say, hello, why don't we do something else? The fire that's out of control will say, something more exciting. Yeah, something more exciting. <clears throat> yeah, your water will say, I feel sad. You have some other stimulation. Maybe your earth um, would be so strong that the strategy you use is to lose awareness and drift off. Like, uh, maybe you could do that. Or maybe your earth is so strong that you go to sleep. Maybe put you to like so we need to reintegrate these. And how is this done? Well, for your meditation, each and every time you improve your practice, and this meditation doesn't have to be a seated meditation, there are some mysterious orders that use rituals. 
some of them they memorize a ritual. It's a weird idea, but follow me with this. <laughs> so you memorize a ritual to the point where you've got everything exact. So if you forget yourself for a second and drift off, you'll make a mistake. And they've got knocks and signs and where things have to go and everything like that. And they've got a whole room full of people that know this. <laughs> your elements will get in the way. And um, it could be your pride. Uh, it could be uh, some of these. In the Hermetic text, this is always transformation of vices into virtues. So um, this is actually a picture from uh, Cleopatra the Alchemist. The text in there says, all things from one. So once we have done this, so once we've got this, and perfection isn't possible in this plane, but we've got most of this um, on board on the same side, and everything's working, so there aren't any large oppositions to your focus, your mind will take on a different quality. And this is a first sense of rebirth. In the Hermetic text, often this accompanies an out-of-the-body experience. And sometimes this is through ritual, sometimes this is spontaneous, sometimes it's an aha moment, and sometimes it's a demonstration. So there's actually um, one particular one where Hermes steps forth out of the body and says, can you see me? And Tat says, no, I can't. He says, oh, if only you could step forth as in a dream or in your imagination. And eventually Tat does start to see him. So this gives you freedom. This is the regrowing of the red wings. Um, it's worth noting at this point that Hermes has four wings traditionally. He has on his feet and on his head. So we can imagine that this person would have to have the right mind and the right actions. So we could imagine that by level steps and upright intentions, he could ascend unpolluted. That this would allow him to start going up the ladder, start to go to the things. So once that's happened, you can start to empower these elements to a higher degree than most people. So there are specific techniques for these, there are visualizations. You could see this in, in Hermeticism, it's, it's directly to do with the um, elemental energy. So this mind stuff we've got, this energy of the mind that makes everything, it can take on different qualities, just like your imagination. But it can also take on force from outside it. And it can get better at doing that. And that's this stage. So we're going to start to empower those elements of our personality. This would be the chakras opening in uh, the uh, Hindu tradition. And this would allow us to rise up um, to higher levels in our awareness. Once this has happened, something beautiful happens. You become a, a receptacle for these, the, the higher forces. Your vices have become virtues. Your, you've developed these energies to a higher ability. And then you can start to link with the one. Now here's where it gets lovely. In the Arabic version of this, which is, uh, it's, um, it doesn't say quite that. It says that the microcosm will become a reflection of the macrocosm, and the macrocosm becomes a reflection of the microcosm. Same kind of thing. Thus you will receive the glory of all the distinctiveness of the world, and all obscurity will flee from you. And there, there are different interpretations of this. So. Spiritual senses um, work by having, um, by receiving in your substance of the mind the vibrations or the senses of what's around you. And um, because you've trained it and cleared that, you haven't got the obstacles. So the person who has a large area of their water element, which is to do with love and so on, that can't take on clear forms. They, they can't get out of their own way. You have practiced your visualization, you've practiced your imagination exercises, your techniques. Your mind is far more pliable now, your mind stuff. It can take on clear images very gently. So it's like almost pressing mud on a surface to make the imprint. You just need to be near what you need to sense, and you can let go and you will take on the, the form of what's around you, just naturally, just like we hear noise, or just like vibration goes through things. You can, your preconceptions, your limitations, your consciousness is so clear you can see it. 
This is Gnosis. And the highest degree of Gnosis would, of course, be to take on the vibration of everything. Likewise, the obscurity will flee from you. At this point in your development, it's very hard to hide as a practitioner because you can achieve great things far, with far more ease than your fellow man. They have associations with hard work and success, and I'm not saying that isn't always true, but you can see the, the soft spot. You can be strategic. You can also be truthful. You're not being weighed down with inner conflict or mixed goals. You don't need to prove anything to anyone else or uh, waste your energy. So some skills will start to shine through depending on your own nature. You'll become a great musician if you like music. You'll become a great writer if you, if you write. Okay, so this is the whole most strong strength of all strength, for it overcomes all subtle things and penetrates all solid things. You have um, all heard of um, different practices which are said to be able to influence the world. We, let's think of some of the, the more, most questionable ones that no one here would wish to partake of. We can see in early religions and traditions that um, people will kill an animal in order to bring around an effect. And now with our hermetic vision, we can see why this works. If you kill an animal, this energy of the mind is released temporarily and can be imprinted strongly. And that imprint can go on to make something happen. Likewise, other questionable practices appear. People um, tend to use the energy associated with procreation and in tantric rites to try to make things happen. And they'll use substances that contain energy, whether it be blood or whether it be certain herbs or certain stones that take it on, or light, this shining lights from certain um, planets or certain places. <coughs> All these practices to the hermeticist are not uh, important because they don't change you. Now, you can have direct influence. So your mind is so strong, it's beyond that of your fellow man, and you are able to perceive and tune in to the energies around you. You can form things as the divine forms things of the mind. And this can be subtle. It can be seeing the ripple effect. I know of a, a great hermetic master who, uh, a, a, a neighbor of his was very ill. And he planted a, um, a lavender bush in her garden. He didn't talk to her, he just planted this. And it was very strange, in his wisdom, because of his oneness, he knew the knock-on effect of that would transform her life. Now, I don't know all the mechanisms behind how it did, uh, but some of it was to her emotions. So when she saw the lavender, she thought, well, maybe I'll clean up this area. Maybe I'll do something in this garden. And the interaction with something, something to live, something fragrant, something uplifting. So the hermetic practitioner can have direct influence um, rather than engaging. And you will see in the hermetic text that the practices I talk about are very much discouraged and seen as a, um, a confused shortcut to the, the correct way. Now, thus was the world created. Let's talk about that direct way. So the marvellous adaptions from this procedure, everything is going on. There are natural creative forces at work. Now, I'm only going to touch on this very gently because um, of uh, this is a public speech, but what if, rather than doing something artificial, what if that that mechanism that's going on, so just like we're thinking things, what if the underlying flow that's making everything work, what if you could just make small adjustments? That, that would be the, uh, the path there. And what if you could just redirect what was already happening into where it should go directly 
and the health of the mind. Many people will be aware of this symbol. You will note that in the, the Gabbana, the creation of the universe, and the root back corresponds to some degree. In the Hermetic path, it is even more so. The Hermeticists are now at this stage of their enlightenment will start to ascend through higher levels of consciousness, and these correspond to the planets. Now, remember I said that the meditation is internal for the Eastern and external for the, um, for the um, Westerner. This is still true. So we've balanced our elements, and we're, we've demonstrated those abilities, and with our meditations on the world around us, the, Hindu is going up through their chakras, through their seven chakras inside themselves. Not so the Hermeticists, not so the Western tradition. No, you are going to ascend through the seven other levels of existence. Just like this world, you are going to visit heaven and you're going to go through them. And each level is going to bring a new level of purification and a new level of understanding and new abilities. And these vibrations will come down into your normal life in your practice. And uh, this is why Enoch and, of course, and uh, Hermes were seen as the same. Therefore, I am called Hermes, thrice crowned, because I have three parts of the wisdom of the world. Many people have had fun trying to work out what these three parts are. Could it be the crown of Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, and then a third sort of invisible kind of spiritual one in the middle? Could it be that there were three... Uh, degrees of um, the age of mysteries that the person would go through. Uh, could it be that um, he has all the knowledge of the areas that can transform things? So he's got uh, the knowledge of alchemy and of magic and of theurgy. I believe um, that if we, we read the Hermetic texts and we read between the lines, we can see that probably it did come just from the original thrice greats from ancient Egypt, but it came to mean something else to the uh, Hermeticists. They wanted to cultivate three qualities in you, three qualities which would keep lifting you up this path. The first one was this noose, higher awareness, higher awareness in all moments. So when you're writing a check, <coughs> when you buy books, for example, you will, that's your calligraphy lesson. When you're driving, every time you drive, you're improving. And this doesn't happen for most people. You know, that's actually the, the hermetic, real hermetic mystery isn't how to do it, it's why it doesn't. So children, when they first are born, they, their awareness grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. But yet, you don't have to go very far to meet someone who's doing something eight hours a day, like whether they're a barman or they're changing tyres, and if you watch them, there's no improvement at all year from year. They still go to the wrong shelf. They still... If anyone here actually practised something for eight hours a day, imagine if you were practising juggling for eight hours a day, how good you'd be in a year. So there is something that means we're not engaging. And hermeticism is about removing that veil, moving that impurity. So now, awareness, that's number one. How do they develop awareness? Through their meditation, through speeches uh, like this, through daily, daily life. The second one is logos, the word. Um, in the sense of, um, they used to use the term rational speech. So practicing hermeticism was everything you said would make sense, and everything you thought would make sense, and nothing would be incongruent. Everything would be truthful. The, the practice of speech was very well known in, as philosophers as a means to straightening out these imbalances and getting yourself truthful. The hermeticists actually also used silence. So let's imagine the opposite could be true if I said to you, right, from now on you can never express anything with words. 
If you want to make a special dinner for your wife, it's got to be special. You can't say, oh, my darling, this is a lovely romantic dinner for you. Look what I've done with this. You can't do it. You have to actually put the candles out. You have to put the thing out. The meal has to be special. If you want to be good, you can't say you're good. You can't do anything to create the image. You've got to actually go and save lives. You've got to give your money. You've got to give your time. There's, there's no way you could do that. So silence, they felt, straightened you out as much as talking. Um, so we've got this uh, quality of our truthfulness and our awareness. The next one is gnosis, direct knowledge. Now, people here may have heard of Gnosticism and so on. So Gnosis is knowledge of the heart. And this, um, remember I was talking about tuning into the vibrations of things. From the hermetic point of view, your intuition is this. It just needs to be deified. you just got to amplify it. So your intellect, uh, your awareness, and uh, your intuition are all going to reach the next level. Someone, and in using that, so there are many people here in this room who perhaps have got some senses like this, but how often when you meet someone do you think, just take a few moments just to sense what they're like. Just take a few moments. So using it. And Gnosis was often achieved through um, study and through um, kind of like a guided visualisation and through prayer. And complete is what I have to say about the work of the sun. So we've reached our goal now. We've all... Uh, gone through that purification. Our elements are balanced. We've learned to master the hidden talents we've got and bring all of them into balance. We practice all the things we found hard. And then we've learned to go through these seven levels to reach the highest stage. And now we do not have a normal human consciousness. Our, our mind is adamant, it is solid, it is immortal. Uh, we walk with the uh, other immortals. We have transformed base metals into gold. Thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to have a extended version of this, and I'm very sorry this was quite extended already. <laughs> uh, and then there's a book available which is where I go really in depth. And that, uh, for the, the air people, that does have references to the extra <laughs>